Uh, thanks, Claire. Can you hear me all right? Um, aloha, awinala. I don't know a whole lot of Maori, but that's the closest I can come in Hawaiian, which is got to be a related language. In other words, good afternoon. And mahalo and kiamihi, especially to the organizers for choosing my presentation that this is my third NDF ever. And a special mahalo to Andy Fenton and the crew at NZFS and Recollect for making it possible for me to be here. Um, if I hadn't had Andy and Ed ZMS, you, I wouldn't be doing this now. And I'd also like to thank the entire country of New Zealand for being just so damn beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a beautiful part of the United States in, in Montana, which, um, except for the lack of oceans, reminds me a bit of New Zealand. But I have to, have to say, every time, the third time that I've come to New Zealand now, it's it's seems more beautiful than the last time. So I'm here to talk about something perhaps not so pretty. This is um, the Tosling Genocide Museum in Phnom Penh, uh, Cambodia. The, the museum itself is an old school, S21, that was used as a prison during the Khmer Rouge, the, the, the reign of the Khmer Rouge from 1975 to 1979. The Khmer Rouge actually existed all during the 60s and, be, and the early 70s as well before they overthrew the king and his government uh, and then ruled from 1975 to 1979. The uh, Tosleng Genocide Museum archives are actually um, a UNESCO sponsored or UNESCO Memory of the World uh, registered in July 2009. Uh, this is a project sponsored by UNESCO and funded by the Korean International Devel uh, Cooperation Agency and, of course, with a collaboration of the Tosleng Museum and the Cambodian Culture and Arts Ministry. And once the project is finished, these archives will be internet accessible, uh, although at present we're not quite at that stage yet. As I mentioned before, the Tolslang Museum and its archives are housed in the school, in the S21 school, a prison for Cambodians during the uh, during the uh, uh, Khmer Rouge regime. From here, prisoners typically uh, went to the killing fields, which are not far from from the center of uh, Phnom Penh. When the museum was, when the school was lim liberated, or when Cambodia was liberated by um, by the Vietnamese in uh, January 1979, there were only seven remaining prisoners in, in this prison. Um, I mentioned already that these are inscribed, that the, that the archives were inscribed into the UNESCO's Memory of the World Register in July 2009. They're especially fragile because they were mostly put on low quality um, media, uh, school book paper, for example, uh, photographs with no particular um, attention given to long-term preservation. Um, and th the museum itself is not exactly ideal for climate control, uh, very humid, as you could imagine, and with an unreliable power source. During the Khmer Rouge, it's estimated that somewhere between a million and a half and two million and two and a half million people were killed or died of starvation uh, during from April 75 to 19 to January 1979. If you figure two million people, that's if you to make it to bring it a little bit home, that's over four years, 1,370 people per day, 57 per hour, or one every minute either killed or starved. What finally ended the Khmer Rouge regime was during this time, their army also conducted cross-border raids into Vietnam where it murdered people and burned villages. Uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia in December 1978 and by January 1979, the regime was gone. Oh, what happened here? 
Here we go. So these are the uh, companies and institutions that collaborated on this project. Uh, I'll come back to the top two in a minute, but the governmental partner is the Cambodian Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts, the Korean International Cooperation Agency funded it, and UNESCO and the museum itself are, are the, uh, the principal collaborators who helped organize the project. Brecken is, Brecken Imaging is a Canadian uh, imaging and preservation company um, of a handful of people. Uh, they sent a preservationist, a conservationist to, to Phnom Penh to essentially guide the, uh, guide the, guide everyone, guide the entire project team in, in um, preserving the materials. Digital Divide Data is a company that I've worked with for many years. It's a U.S. nonprofit that recruits young people in Cambodia, Laos, and Kenya, um, generally from the countryside or the slums. In any case, they don't have many upper, um, economic opportunities. They do have an education. Um, DDD gives them a job, trains them uh, in computer skills and whatever, and other business skills, uh, gives them a job for six to eight hours a day, um, and as well as full benefits and a scholarship to the local university. So when they come to DDD, these, these kids aren't, aren't uh, very skilled at all. They learn skills, but as far as skills for preservation or conservation, they're non-existent. Just some brief statistics about the project. Uh, US half million to do everything, the imaging, buy all the equipment, um, and do the uh, actual work, pay the people, pay the staff. Uh, you can see the activities, cataloging, the catalog at the Toslang Museum was not particularly good, so a lot of, the cat a lot of work was in cataloging the materials, preservation, um, in, a, in a place that's not very well, that's very humid and not, doesn't have a good climate control, you can imagine that there were mold and other issues with the school book paper on which some of the conventions were written. Uh, scanning and capture, um, image editing and post processing and finally capturing uh, the descriptive metadata and building a website around it. 10 staff from Digital Divide Data, these are the students I was mentioned, and 11 staff from the museum. The, the uh, museum staff was, by and large, um, also mostly unskilled staff. One of the principal uh, um, goals of the project was to build the capacity and train the museum staff so that, so that in future they could do it by themselves. I mentioned that, um, I, well, actually I didn't mention, this is the largest repository of such materials in Cambodia, but it's not the only one. Uh, this project was only for the Toll Slang Genocide Museum archives, but in future that may be added, there may be more added to it. I'm not quite sure why this is so pokey and there we go. So um, we designed a workflow process for this and decided rather than teach some of the people some of the process, we would train all, everyone on everything. And that tur turned out rather well. You can see some of the material, some of the equipment that we used, uh, some of the training um, that we provided. Uh, we actually did follow the FADGI uh, digitization standards. If you don't know what PAGI is, think metamorphose, it's about the same thing. Um, and provided all of the, the uh, metadata, descriptive and technical, the descriptive metadata was captured in two languages, Khmer and in English. So, um, we had to supply a lot of equipment. Most of it was brought in uh, from abroad, so most often hand carried. For example, uh, all of the cameras, all of the lights were brought in from, from elsewhere, from Canada or from the US. Uh, the computers 
some of them were sourced locally, but the specialized computers were not were brought in from outside. Um, we also had to install air conditioning. That was one of the features of the tender from UNESCO is you have to buy air conditioning. And oh, by the way, you also have to supply internet access. There was no internet access at the museum before this project started. They did have computers, but they were isolated computers and rather old computers. You see here an idea of what the materials are in the Genocide Museum uh, archive. Uh, photos, confessions, biographies, revolutionary magazines, Khmer Rouge handbooks. Uh, the microfilms were actually created by Yale University and one other that I can't remember right now, uh, but they were duplicates of things that, have already, that, that, of things that were already in the archive. You get an idea of how we captured the materials. Um, either Fagi four star, you don't get much better than that, or Fagi three star, um, depending on what material type was captured. Uh, all of these were captured, some were captured on a flatbed scanner, but most of the materials were captured with a camera. I mentioned the, the team had a very limited skill set, like no skills, until this project started. Lots of power interruptions. Most of these cameras and lights were driven by battery packs that were charged when uh, the power was on. Um, I believe that, that since, uh, since we started the project, the, it now has um, uh, continue, a UPS uh, installed, but I've not been there to actually see that. Um, the targets were particularly time consuming and troublesome to teach the staff how to use them. Well, you can read this for yourself and if you can't read it fast enough, uh, I understand that these are going to be online. Again, another um, slide il illustrating the, the difficulties that we had to overcome. Uh, the pictures that you see on your right are the actual digitization room. When we put that equipment into the room, we couldn't touch the walls. The walls had to be left as is because on the walls, you'll find um, things left by the prisoners. The workflow, um, first prepare the materials, the usual remove staples, look at the, um, take the, take the uh, mold away if there's any, and mostly uh, you had to treat all the materials for mold. Um, prepare the, the documents, these are th three teams. The, the members of the team rotated, but three teams one would prepare, one would capture, and one would do the editing or um, whatever else needed to be done to the images. And finally, the, store, the uh, files, all of the files were stored on uh, a local network attached server and um, transferred from there to Digital Divide Data's production offices in, in, Phnom, <coughs> in Phnom Penh and from there to AWS. That's strictly for preservation. The, uh, Cambodian government is very sensitive about not having these materials leave the country. For the descriptive metadata, uh, we had the assistance of, a, uh, of an Australian metadata expert who, who, and she knew quite a lot about Cambodia and uh, the Khmer Rouge, um, as well as the uh, Thos Lang archives. Um, some of the difficulties in capturing the uh, descriptive metadata was the vocabularies in the 70s have changed a lot since, uh, since um, the Khmer Rouge, the, or the um, transliteration, there's no guide for transliterating a name or a place name uh, from Khmer to English. Um, lots of fields to capture just because of the diversity of materials. And what do you do? 
where, what about the ethical questions? What do you do with this information that is often extracted under torture? Also, if, if prisoners were interrogated by more than one uh, more than one person, there's going to be differences in their confessions. What do you do? Capture both? Ultimately, there will be two databases, uh, with um, one with documents and one with images. Um, the um, languages, as I said, are going to be both Khmer and English, at least for now. Uh, Khmer already exists. Most of the staff, uh, all of the staff speaks Khmer, but there's very limited English. Uh, that's still a work in progress. Um, I want to show what some of the what some of the descriptive metadata looks like. It's a little bone chilling. Um, at the top, you see a list of the content types, and underneath, some of the descriptive metadata. So. One of the stipulations of the UNESCO tender was that this be, that the uh, data be crowd accessible. First, they wanted crowd sourcing, which means to me, and I think to most, that the crowd, Cambodians, will be able to contribute or comment or correct uh, whatever descriptive metadata there is or add comments to photos and so forth. After several months of debate, it was decided that comments won't be allowed. People may correct data, um, and the corrections must be reviewed by an administrator of some sort before they're actually published. Uh, researchers may be granted special access, um, and administrators, of course, can do, in, do anything they want with, it, with the data. But part of the website is multi-level access controls so that so that a, an ordinary Cambodian, an ordinary user of the data, can see some stuff, but not other stuff. The, the, um, it's also possible to leave, or to, to make corrections, or make other additions to the uh, data itself, but only if you register, only if you're a registered user. An unregistered user can view it only. You can read this for yourself, but there's not a whole lot of research about this period in Cambodia. Some of the reasons for that is it's, uh, it's very, it was of course very traumatic for Cambodia. Um, other reasons are, well, if you look at when this happened in 75 to 79, so uh, the Khmer Rouge existed before most of you in this room were born. I see a few gray hairs, so I know that you'd at least heard about it uh, from that time. The older generation, the, the people who experienced the Khmer Rouge, don't talk about it. They don't talk about it to their young people, and the young people don't ask questions about what happened then. So it's, it's like um, a, a blank spot in, in Cambodian history. Because, or perhaps because, the Cambodian uh, population is so young, about 70% of it is under 30 years of old. Uh, they look more to the future than to the past. And this is from a region of the world where, where ancestors and where the past is honored. I didn't think my slides were that. Okay. The copyright law in Cambodia says, because these are educational materials, we do have the right to publish them. But should we publish them? Um, some people are looking for answers to what happened during that period in, in Cambodia. Researchers, often foreign researchers. Uh, but it could harm the families. And if you think about the age of, of, 
of people who might have participated in the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, let's say they were 20 when the Khmer Rouge came to power and were probably in the army. So what would they be now, 60, 70? Uh, most likely uh, they're still around. Um, they may have government positions. How do you publish data or should you publish data about what they might have done? This is the website that's still not yet online. Uh, some of the issues around what should be exposed and what not exposed are still being worked out between UNESCO, which wants everyone to see everything, and the Cam Cambodian government, which is uh, far more conservative. It doesn't want to, um, it wants to restrict access to at least some of the metadata. Um, but this should be, if things go according to schedule, this should be online early next year. This was a project done by people with very limited skills, but because we had a very talented and skilled conservationist, uh, Jacqueline Vincent from Brecon Imaging, guiding the project, um, every, everyone, all the members of the project team, learned everything and, and can, can at least in theory do it in, by themselves in future. We were also quite fortunate because we had a project manager who was born to Cambodian parents. His, father, his father's family left Cambodia before the Khmer Rouge came to power, moved to France. His mother, his mother's immediate family, also left Cambodia and moved to France, but most of her family stayed behind in Cambodia. And he, to, the project manager to this day, doesn't know what happened to his mother's family. He's 29 years old. He had a university education in, in France and came back to Cambodia to lead this project. I don't have any other, anything else to say. You can look for some more information at these, um, at these uh, URLs if you like. Um, you can see some of the photos of the project team in work. The one in the, in the lower left, that's a photo of the project manager. The one in the lower right is Jacqueline Vincent, the, the woman from Canada who, who did most of the preservation and conservation work. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I've got about 50 questions, but one, I'll start with one. The decision to do the whole thing in English and the local language, was that a hard decision or how did you arrive at the decision? Or uh, if it seems to me, it, had it only been in the local language, that would have contained it more and made it less susceptible to international scrutiny? Did those thoughts go through your mind? Uh, they certainly didn't go through my mind. The crowdsourcing bit, I thought, though, this is not going to last when I first saw UNESCO's uh, stipulation that this must be crowdsourced or crowdsourceable when it's completed. Um, I think the Cambodian government is less worried about the international view of this data than it is about the Cambodian view of this data. But that's only a guess on my part. I, I don't really know. The uh, Khmer in English, that was a stipulation of the project to begin with. And because mo most of this, most of these descriptive metadata fields are in Khmer, then it makes more sense to put it in Khmer, leave it in English or not. Well, uh, there's not very many people outside of Cambodia that speak Khmer, so it, it should be in English as well. Um, I'm just interested. Oh, it's pretty loud. Sorry. Um, and the kind of cultural safety for the people who are working with this. I, I've been to this museum. It's incredibly traumatic. The photos in particular are not always when the prisoner is alive anymore. You can see details of their, you can see evidence of the torture. Um, it's really heavy stuff. So it wasn't touched at all in it, but I just think these Khmer people working on this about their own people, I just really worry for their, <laughs> The, you know, at the end of the day, how 
traumatic. You know, it's just, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awful yeah. stuff, so. Um, I can't speak to it at all because I've not been, since the project started, I, I helped get the project underway, but since the project started, I've not visited there. If you really want an answer to your question, I can put you in touch with uh, the project manager. He's probably the best person to ask that question of. But, uh, but I agree, I, it, to me it would seem terribly traumatic or depressing to work in a former prison where you can see evidence of the torture and whatnot every day. So, uh, we're out of time. If you'd like to join me in thanking Frederick.